Good morning. Welcome to Lockwood. Hope you're having a great weekend with family and remembering those that have served us. And uh, so why don't we join our spirits and hearts to the one who serves us always. Psalm 90, verses 13 through 17. Relent, O Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I invite you to stand with me and sing. Come thou almighty king. from Colossians 3, 23 through 25. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong and there is no favoritism. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we remember the sacrifice that your son made for us to purchase us for you, to rescue us out of the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the, his own kingdom, the kingdom of your son. We want to worship you today. We want to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you through the name of Jesus. We want to make that sacrifice of ourselves with our praises, but we need your help. We ask your spirit to stir our hearts today, to be the spirit of wisdom and revelation to us in the knowledge of you. Would you reveal to us by illumining our eyes the hope of your calling and the riches of the glorious inheritance in your saints and your great power for those who believe. Grant us this, Lord, so that we might be all yours. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join with me again. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart, clean it from earth, through all its pulses move, 
stand for the reading of the gospel. From Luke 6, 32 through 36. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This song we're going to sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. I invite you to think on these words that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to do what he asks us to do, and it is he who holds us fast. So we're going to sing this song next.
justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast, raise with him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me.
your seated, greet those folks who are around you, and then you can have a seat. And when you're seated, take a look at your bulletin. I need to highlight a few announcements for you today. <clears throat> Would you read about the diaper drive for Beginnings Care for Life? We want to bless them with diapers so they take care of families who are starting off and having children and sometimes struggling financially too. And this is one way that we can be a help to them in their ministry. So read about that. Read about the ladies' picnic that's coming up this month. Congregational meeting is going to be on Tuesday the 6th. That's a week from tomorrow. So the admin board is presenting two uh, proposals to the congregation. One is a change in the bylaws, and that has to do with the search committee. So we started without aligning what we were doing with bylaws, and we need to make sure that we get the bylaw stuff right here. So we want to take care of that. And also a pay increase for our non-salaried workers you can read about that. There's a sheet out on the cafe tables just outside these doors that talk about both the proposals. So would you look at those and then come for the congregational meeting on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. That's Tuesday the 6th. Vacation Bible School is coming up, and we want you to be a part of that. If you can help, we're going to be over here in our children's assembly area for Vacation Bible School. You can mark on the tear-off and let us know that you can be a part of that in the week of of June 11th, so during that week. It'll be in the morning as well. Uh, the Mexico team has raised f almost half of their budget this year. So Taco Tuesday was a great success, and thank you all for supporting that. I encourage you to be generous as they move forward with the last half of what they need to raise to send our students down to serve in Tijuana. So there are still Mexico service projects to be had. If you have work at home and you want to support the Mexico team in this way, you can invite them over to do that work. You can let us know about that on the tear-off. Just put it in the offering plate in a few moments. Uh, we're going to have a prayer helpers training. So every, every service, after the service, we have prayer helpers who are available to pray with people, whatever their needs are. And we want those prayer helpers to be well-trained. We're going to have another prayer helper training on the 11th, right after second service. If you would like to be a part of that, even if you say, I don't want to be a prayer helper, but I'd like to know better how to pray for people, would you mark the tear off and let us know that you're going to be coming? I think I'll let you read the rest of the announcements. We're going to worship the Lord now with our offering. So guys, if you'll come and help us with that, we'd really appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, would you grab a register? You're going to find it on that side of a row, probably under your seat. Pull it out, sign it, pass it that way, and then send it back to where it started. Maybe you'll see somebody in your row you don't know. Go up and greet them after the service. You make a, a new friend today. And by the way, there's food out here for the coffee hour, a coffee half hour, but we might stretch it a little more than a half an hour. Hang out today. Instead of going out the door, go into the lobby and hang out with your friends and meet some new ones. Lord, we offer this to you. This is our act of one act of worship. We ask you to see in our gifts a token of our intent to give our lives to you for your glory through Jesus. Amen. I have a 
children till their children. Let this be their memory. That all my treasure was in heaven. And you were everything to me. There are prayer needs listed in your bulletin each week. I just want to direct your attention there and ask you to pray for these needs. If you know these folks, would you see what you can do to encourage them, help them, um, give them a call or send them a card or something like that. But let's pray for them, and we'll do it right now. Lord, every week we have some kind of victory and some kind of loss. But our hope is in you. We're not looking to the end of the week, but to the fulfillment of the age when your son returns. I pray that you'll help our friends share that hope. And Lord, would you meet them in their need? Would you use us to be a part of that? To love them well. We want to pray for your church and other places where it's meeting today. We ask your blessing on your people wherever they are. May your word be rich to them. May their fellowship be sweet. May their, their community be one of love and unity. And what we ask for them, we ask for us. I pray now that you will speak to us your word. Lord, we need to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Would you use Kevin to speak your word to us now? In Jesus' name, amen. Our text this morning is just one verse. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It'll be on the screen for you here, I think. It goes like this. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters... Stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Tomorrow is Memorial Day 
And on Memorial Day, we remember the men and the women who sacrificed their lives in service to our country. In 1917, the first army recruitment poster with a picture of Uncle Sam appeared with the words, I want you for the US Army. The poster worked. People were motivated to enlist, to serve in World War I because they knew that they were wanted, that they were needed for a cause that was bigger than themselves. In World War II, it wasn't just the soldiers, but even the folks who stayed home who sacrificed for the war effort. Women went to work outside of the home, children collected scrap metal and other things to support the war effort. People limited the number of meals they ate per week, sacrificed comfort and convenience. More recently, the US Army has had to modify their recruitment methods. So they changed their slogan in 1980 to be all you can be. Instead of pointing to a bigger cause, the Army promises its recruits self-fulfillment if they join. In recent commercials for the Army, they present joining as a way where you can redefine yourself, improve yourself, challenge yourself. Rather than calling people to sacrifice of themselves for the good of others, the Army has had to coax people to join through the motivation of self-gain. They know that people are gonna be asking the question, what's in it for me? And so the army has given the answer, we're here to help you get what you want out of life. Now, I hope you're not, you don't think that I'm trying to criticize the army at all, and I'm certainly not trying to criticize people who join and serve in the army. I'm actually making a point about our human nature. It's hard for us to work to sacrifice, to give effort, even for our families, if we don't receive an immediate benefit or reward. We grow easily discouraged, disgruntled. We get bored if things aren't paying off. Now maybe if we could see that our work mattered, that our efforts made a huge difference, that'd be one thing. But to go through the daily grind of trouble, of toil, without result, without success, without at least a little bit of personal gain, that's hard for everybody. That's why this last verse of 1 Corinthians 15 is so powerful for us who have chosen to live our lives for God. The life of a disciple is anything but easy. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That's what Paul and Barnabas told their converts. But we can go through on through this because our labor in the Lord is not in vain, as Paul tells us at the end of this verse. It's not useless. It's not without purpose. It won't be without result or reward, even though it seems like it sometimes. Paul says, you know. You know that it's not in vain. How do we know? We know that our work is not in vain because God's work in Christ is sure to succeed. From the beginning of creation until this very day, God has been working toward one great goal. Do you know what it is? Do you know what the one great goal that God's been working at? God's master plan is to bring everything and everyone in heaven and on earth under the authority and the control of one king, Jesus Christ. And when this is finally done, Paul says this 30 verses earlier, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. When it's finally done, the Son himself will be made subject to the Father who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Everything that God's done in the past and all the events that have led up to this present moment are for the purpose that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the master plan. And that master plan of God's can be summarized with the words, the kingdom of God. So when Paul tells us in our verse, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, Literally, 
always abound in the work of the Lord. This is the work he's talking about. The great work he's been doing since the beginning. He's saying, saying, join in this work. God's work is to bring everything into submission to Jesus. And this is the work that you and I were put on this planet to do. That work can never be in vain. It can never be useless because God's purposes and God's promises do not fail. David Brainerd was a missionary in the 1740s, and he felt God's strong call on his life to go and witness to the Native Americans who were living in New England. But his work seemed fruitless for a long time. He struggled terribly to learn the Native American language. He was often exhausted. He was often sick. And because he was white, the people really distrusted him. After two years, David Brainerd wrote in his journal that his prospect of winning converts was as dark as midnight. And in the third and fourth year, he had a relatively small number of the natives finally convert to the faith. And in the fifth year, he died. He died in the home of his would-be father-in-law, Jonathan Edwards. And so we have to ask the question, did he die before, before he found success in his work? Was his labor in the Lord in vain? No. No, of course not. The Lord does not measure the work of his servants in accomplishments or in effectiveness, but in terms of love and faithfulness. After he died, Jonathan Edwards published David Brainerd's journals. Every page of them is filled with this longing for God and a longing for holiness. But his entries were also very honest about how he felt and his personal struggles. He often had strong feelings of his own sinfulness, of his loneliness, of his worthlessness, doubts about whether his life's work would be of any value in the end. But even while his life was full of hardship and struggles and his work felt ineffective most of the time, God used his faithful example. William Carey, who started the, the modern Protestant missionary movement, which has converted millions and millions of people worldwide, he pointed to Brainerd's journal as the key source of his inspiration to take up the missionary life. Edwards says that Brainerd's example, his life, shows the right way to success in the work of the ministry. By his example of laboring, praying, denying himself, and enduring hardship, with unfainting resolution and patience, and his faithful, vigilant, and prudent conduct in many other respects. That's what success looks like. Now, it must be said that the promise that our labor is not in vain does not apply to everything we do. Many of the things that people work at and hope for will be pointless in the end. It's only when we labor in the Lord that we can know for sure that our labor is not in vain. So in Luke, in Luke chapter 10, Luke tells a story about when Jesus visited the home of Martha and Mary. Martha's frustrated because she's doing all the cooking and all the cleaning and all the hosting while her sister Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him teach. And when Jesus sees Martha's frustration, he says to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and you're upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen the better, and it will not be taken from her. Now, it's not that Martha's hosting work was unimportant. In fact, if she hadn't done her work to host, then maybe Jesus might not have been able to use that opportunity to teach. The problem is that Martha had forgotten the reason why she was doing the work. And if she had remembered, she would have done her work gladly. There is only one thing. There's only one great work that we've all been called to do. 
but we all have different roles in making that happen. Doing our work in the Lord is not the same as doing our work in the church. We can do God's work at home. We can do God's work in our secular jobs. We can even do God's work on vacation. On the other hand, it's possible to do ministry without doing it in the Lord. Think of the people who say to, God, to Jesus at the end, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform miracles? And Jesus will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. Many sermons have been preached, ministries administered, worship songs performed, missionary efforts made that were not done in the Lord. Laboring in the Lord is not so much about what we're doing, but why we're doing it and who we're doing it for. When we labor, when we pray, and when we deny ourselves, when we endure hardship for the sake of Christ, to see his kingdom come in our lives and in our world, then our effort is never a waste. Never. We all have different lives to live. We have different gifts to use. But we must do what we do for the glory of God. The month of May is family month. Our theme is that things are possible in the Lord that are not possible outside him. This verse has a promise in it, that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now we can know that it is possible to endure all hardship and sins and difficulties of family life when you labor at it in the Lord. Not only is it possible, but we can give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord when we labor in the Lord. We can continue to care for our children, to forgive our spouse, to serve our parents, to bear with our in-laws, to love our siblings, and we can do this with a joyful heart because we know for sure that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Paul uses the word kapas, labor, to describe the work of the Lord. Paul uses the word fairly often to describe work that's burdensome, that causes weariness, that brings us to exhaustion. Because we live in a sinful world, and because we ourselves are still sinful, even God's work is not going to come easily. It's not even easy to love our families well, for God's sake. In the Genesis account, God gave mankind the work of filling the earth and subduing it so that God can be all in all. When Adam sinned, the work was not taken away, but it did become more difficult. Remember what God told him? Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat from it all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, You'll eat, eat your food and you re, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you'll return. The woman would continue in the work of the Lord as well. But now her pains in childbearing would be very severe. And with painful labor, she'll give birth to children. To be honest, even just watching my wife in labor was one of the most difficult things for me. But a mother's labor is the picture of our labor in, in the Lord. A woman can't choose when her contractions will come or how painful the process will be or even when she needs to push. She doesn't know how long it's going to take. But each contraction, each push, brings her closer to her joy. In Romans 8, Paul pictures that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And not only that, but we ourselves groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for, the re for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. God never said that living your life for him and for his kingdom was supposed to be easy. He never said that. But because there's going to be joy at the end, we can have hope in the middle. 
it's often by the sweat of our brow that we serve God. And our work sometimes seems to only produce thorns and thistles. Yes, it is labor, but we have the promise our labor is not in vain. There are few things that are more exhausting than trying to be the parent of a whining child or a stiff-necked teenager. There are few things that are more stressful than family drama. There are few things that weigh on the heart like seeing your loved ones suffer as they get older. That's the way it is. And that's the way it has been since Adam fell. But that does not mean that our prayers, our patience, our service, our efforts, our self-denial aren't worth it. Even if they go unappreciated or unnoticed, nothing we do out of love for God and in service to his kingdom is done in vain, nor will it be forgotten by the Lord. And when we serve our families and we encourage their faith, we're building God's kingdom. Now there's a danger in forgetting the bigger cause of God's kingdom when you're going about normal life, and especially normal family life. It's easy to think, I'm serving God when you're doing ministry work. It's hard to remember that you're also contributing to God's kingdom when you change diapers, and you work on the house, and you watch over your elderly parents. When we labor in the Lord, and we love our family for God's sake, we are furthering God's great work, which is to sum up everything under one head, even Christ. During World War II, Britain was going through some of its darkest days. And many of the men who worked in the coal mines wanted to give up their dirty, thankless, and dangerous jobs to join the military. People praised, people supported the soldiers who went to war. Nobody praised the miners. But coal was critical to Britain's war effort. If the miners left their work, the military and the people at home would be in serious trouble. So Winston Churchill saw the problem and he went to encourage the miners and let them know how critical their role was. Churchill painted this picture for them in his speech about what it would be like when the war ended. He said there'd be a grand parade and the people would honor those who had fought in the, in the war. First would come the Navy to great applause. Next, the pilots from the, the Royal Air Force. And then the soldiers who fought at Dunkirk would be celebrated. And last of all would come the coal dusted covered men in miners' caps. And he said, someone in the crowd was, will ask, where were they when the war was being fought? And then thousands of voices will answer, we were in the earth with our faces to the coal. After Churchill's speech, the miners went back to their work with a new resolve because they were reminded of the bigger purpose that they were serving. When we find ourselves growing weary and discouraged and frustrated in the life and the work that God has for us to do, we must go back to the bigger cause. We have to remember it. This life, our families, our jobs, they're not about us. They're about Christ. Everything is about Christ. And by his grace and his mercy, God has made it so that even our most menial tasks, even our most frustrating roles are worth it when they're done in the Lord. If he doesn't fail to reward someone who gives a cup of cold water to one of his little ones, as he says in Matthew 10, 42, he's not gonna fail to reward us. And it's not just about what we do, but even more so who we become that gets weaved into this beautiful tapestry that God's creating out of this world. We don't just offer our work, we offer ourselves and God's kingdom enters into our hearts. But what about those times when we fail in our work? What happens if sin gets the better of us? Frustrations come to the surface. 
our best intentions dissolve into half-hearted living. I don't know if you noticed, but I started my sermon expositing the end of the verse instead of the beginning. Paul starts this great verse with the all-important word, therefore. That means that this verse doesn't stand alone. It's related to what came before. 1 Corinthians 15 is a long chapter. It's all about the resurrection of Jesus, which guarantees that our resurrection is coming. And in the verse right before our text, verse 57, Paul says this, But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the victory over sin and death. Did you catch that? He gives us the victory. It's not something we have to earn or accomplish. That's why we can stand firm, as Paul says, and give ourselves fully to the work of God day after day. This is why we know that our labor is not in vain, even when we feel like we're failures. The victory has already been won. It was won on the day that Jesus stepped out of that tomb. Now Jesus is in heaven, and he's waiting until all things are put under his feet. And while he waits, we wait, and we do our work. So then, what do we do? when we fail and we grow weary and we want to give up and give out, we do what this verse says. We get back up and we stand firm again, letting nothing move us from this hope of the victory and in the knowledge that our labor is not in vain. When we stand firm, it's not by our own power, our own righteousness. If God kept a record of sins, who could stand? No, we stand firm in God's purpose to bring all things, our family and even ourselves, under one head, even Christ. We stand firm in this victory that God has won, the hope of the resurrection, the knowledge that his great plan and his purpose cannot ever fail, and it will be fully accomplished in us when Christ returns. Let nothing move you away from the grace in which we now stand. It's intriguing to me, and I'll finish with this. It's intriguing to me that Paul starts off chapter 15 in verse 1 and 2, pondering the possibility that his preaching and his ministry to the Corinthians might have been in vain. Then, after explaining the mysteries of the resurrection and God's victory in Christ, Paul himself comes full circle and he proclaims in our verse at the very end, we know, we know that our labor is not in vain. Living for God is difficult. Serving other people, even our families, sometimes is labor. But because of what God has done, what we do will never be in vain. Let's pray. God, I pray for the people in this sanctuary who are weighed down, troubled, frustrated, feeling undone with the work that you've set before them. Would you strengthen them, Lord, to stand firm in the greater purpose which you've called them? Would you give them hope in the midst of their difficulties? Would you give them not just hope, but joy in their work, especially in their families, so that they can do all things through your power. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can stand with me. We're going to sing, Satisfy Us With Your Love. And the chorus says when the sun comes up satisfy us before the day has passed us by before our hearts forget all your goodness satisfy us with your love um so just as we sing this remember he he satisfies us with his love and this gives us the strength to continue on in his work
the sun comes up, satisfy us before the day has passed us by, before our hearts forget all your goodness, satisfy. I want to encourage you to hang out today. Instead of leaving, come back here. I know some of you are brand new, never been here before. Stay anyways. Meet some people. Have some, a good time together as we share some food out there. And then a couple of things you need to know. There are Go Deep sheets that are on the cafe tables in the back of the room. They'll help you think through the text that we just heard Kevin preaching about and then apply that to your life. I encourage you to pick one up. On Wednesday evenings at 6.30, we have a group that meets out in the lobby uh, to do just that, to go together through those sheets and think through the text in ways that it can apply to our hearts and to our church. So we want to encourage you to come to that too. We have prayer helpers who will be right up here by this organ this morning. So if you have any prayer need in your life, come on up and they'll be happy to pray with you. They'll keep confidential what you share with them, but they'll remember to pray during the week as well. 
Now, let's pray together. God, grant us a, a, a day that's full of, of you, of good work for your kingdom. Give us hope. Remind us that our labor's not in vain. And we will wait till the day when you sum up everything in heaven and on earth under one head, even Christ our Lord. It's in his good name that we pray this. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his spirit be with us now and forever. Amen.